All right, so Git happens. Um, I'm Jessica Care. My Twitter handle is Jessatron. And I'm here to talk about Git because, like it or not, you need to know what Git is and you need to know how it works. Because if you're not using it yet, either you should be or you will be. So, quick show of hands. Um, left hand, if you've ever used Subversion. Good, good, good. Right hand, if you've ever used Git. Good job, good job, good job. Does anybody currently not use version control on their software? All right, I don't have to tell you to smack yourself. Oh, there's one. Oh, okay. oh let's take his ass. Smack yourself in the head. <laughs> I'm copying directly right now. No, copy directly. Right. Yeah, I'm a good developer out here. <laughs> Dylan, you of all people need it. You right, should just use a SharePoint. Who's got version control books, right? <laughs> Okay, so I came to Git a few months ago when I started at my current job from Subversion. And there's going to be a lot of people making the transition from Subversion to Git. And you can do that in one of two ways. Well, the way everybody does it at first is to pretend they're using Subversion and just type the things in Git that make it work like Subversion. This works fine until it doesn't. <laughs> And, and it's frustrating until then, because why do things have extra steps? Well, things have extra steps because Git is better. <laughs> but you don't know how it's better until you get a little bit into Git and understand how it works. So my goals tonight are to tell you three things about Git. <coughs> One is why it's different and what the motivation is to give you these extra steps and these extra options. And another is to give you the essential concepts that you need to understand what you're doing. And finally, to give you some vocabulary. Because Git has beautiful, long, detailed help pages for all of its options that are written in some secret Git language. So with the little bit of vocabulary I'll give you today, you'll be able to read those pages a little better. And when you want to do something, you'll know what to Google. Because the one thing I'm not going to do is to tell you what to type. No demos. No, you do this, and wow, look what happened. No, 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 no. We're not doing that today. You can find that all over on the internet. Lots of places will tell you what to type. I'm going to tell you what it's doing when you type that. So a couple months ago, um, I, was, I was working along. I was working on a feature, and I was working on the master branch because, you know, it, it was there. And, and I got to a point where I was like, damn, this is more work than I thought. I wish I had branched. Um, and because I needed to go back and work on a bug, and I needed, I, I just really wished I had branched. So I knew there was a way to move my changes, and I'd made a couple commits and whatnot. I knew there was a way to move those um, to a branch. But, you know, it, I didn't know what it was, so I Googled and I eventually typed something, and I eventually got it to work, but it was really painful. Not as painful as the virgin, but it was still painful. And I did that again uh, yesterday, and I was like, oh, right, boom, 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 type two, two lines, and it was done. And it was super easy, because I knew what I was doing. Because I understood the stuff that I'm going to tell you in the next half hour. This stuff is not hard, but it is new concepts, and it's different. So in order to achieve what I achieved yesterday in like two commands, we need to get these technologies down here. So this is your tech tree. And Science Advisor says that in order to learn how to do these operations, we need to learn all these concepts up here. Which is no wonder why I was frustrated trying to figure out how to do it before I made this stop. So we're going to work our way down this tech tree until we can do that. Step one, Git is hard. Yet just accept it. With great power comes great responsibility. Git takes more steps, it takes more concepts, and you have to hold more in your head. Now, on the other hand, because Git is, a little, is more, much more forgiving than Subversion and will let you change history, once we get down here, you can kind of divide your thinking up if you choose to. Think about code, think about code, throw some stuff into a commit whenever you want to save it, and then later you can think about version control. But you do have to think about it. So we'll get into, I'll get into what that power gives you in a minute. But just accept it, it's harder, it's new concepts. We're programmers, we can learn this. 
Next step, unlearn subversion. There's two major differences between Git and subversion. The first one is obvious, because Git is a distributed version control system, and subversion is centralized. So if this is subversion, and this is your team, everybody is putting their changes into the centralized repository, which means whenever you put your changes and you get them wrong, you're breaking everybody's build. Until maybe Jacob here, he, uh, he starts using git subversion, git-svn, and, and, and cheating, but uh, keep in mind that you, you have that option. You can get whether your company is getting or not. Git TFS, that was another one. Yeah. But with Git being distributed, there are actually five repositories on this team. Everybody has their own, and they all sync up with that centralized one. Now, from Git's perspective, there's no such thing as this middle repository. They're all just five repositories. Git is really big on everything is created equal. Every repository is created equal. Every branch is created equal. Just like every person is created equal, but somebody has to be the president. So the fact that this repository is in charge is a social convention. It's not enforced by Git. Typically, this is called origin by default and people start out their repositories as a clone of this, and then this all gets set up for you. Or this might be GitHub, but GitHub is out of scope for this talk. Sorry, you can Google that. All right, so Git is a distributed version of the control system. That's the obvious difference between Git and Subversion. Now let's talk about the more subtle difference, which is Subversion likes to think about your repository in terms of revisions. So started out with code that looked like this. And somebody made a change, and then it looked like this. And somebody made a change, and it looked like this. A bunch of snapshots called revisions <coughs> that the code looked like at a particular point in time. Git turns that sideways. And in Git, you always start from nothing, <coughs> just like the universe. And then the first commit, and the big bang happens. And maybe you added one file, maybe you added 500, no whole complicated directory structure. But that was the first change. Something else changed, something else changed. These snapshots still exist, these pictures of what the code looked like, but that's not the focus of your source control system. The source control is these changes. And we'll call them commits, typically, but they are the set of differences between the snapshots, and that would get, that's what Git operates on. For added confusion, if you know anything about the internal storage mechanisms of Git and Subversion, it's completely the opposite. So don't worry about that. Don't let it confuse you. Subversion operates on revisions, and Git operates on commits, on change sets. That's huge, by the way. Yeah, yeah, but by itself it's nothing. But as we get down, we'll see a little bit of what that means. Next. Tell a story, this is the why. What is the purpose of Git giving you all that power? The answer is, your project and its change history tell a story. Your version control logs tell a story about how your project got to where it is. And in Subversion, it's like you followed your little brother around with a VHS video camera for half the day and then uploaded that to YouTube. That's your story. It's just exactly what happened in all its gory mess. And, and there's, no, there's no narrative to it, typically. Git is different. Git is like you get to edit and preview and decide how you want to tell the story of your project. Now, how, what story you want your project's version history to tell is up to your team. Some people want a lot more detail. Some people want each feature to look like it went in all at once. That's up to your team. But Git lets you decide how to tell your story and then tell it. We'll see four places throughout these technologies um, where Git gives you a tool to tell your project's story. So before that, some <coughs> cool mathy stuff. The shell one hash is a core concept to Git, and it's kind of going to be a bigger concept in programming generally. 
Um, the hash is like an encryption, except it only goes one direction. It's an encoding of a file. It does this for files. It does it for directory structures. It does it for change sets, commits. Each of these gets trans translated into a 40 character hex string. So 40 hex digits. Um, represent each of these objects in Git. We won't talk about the files or the directories because I don't have time. We'll talk a lot about the commits. What these hashes do, you can't get from the hash to the original contents because it's a one-way encryption. But what, what this tells you about the file, about the subdirectory, about the commit, is its identity. Because when you compare these, and Git does a lot of comparing these to make itself fast and to make its storage small, when you compare these, you know if the hash is the same, the objects are the same. Okay, technically, you could have a collision, but you're just as likely to get hit by a meteor on your way to work tomorrow morning. So if that doesn't happen, then trust Git's hashing scheme. Next mathy thing, and this is extremely, extremely core to Git, is the directed acyclic graph. That sounds very mathy, but it's actually, you know, it's not that complicated. A graph has nodes and edges that connect the nodes. That's it, it's a graph. A directed graph, each edge has a direction that says you can only follow it in one direction, from this node to this node, can't go back. An acyclic graph has no circles. Now, you may notice I have a diamond here, but if you're following the arrows of the directed edges, you can never go in a circle. That's it, that's the whole idea of a directed acyclic graph. And this is super core to get, you'll see it all, time, all the time in the man pages, DAG, And that's what it's talking about. Now, Git uses the directed acyclic graph in several places internally, but the one we care about is the commit graph. And in the commit graph, each of these is a commit. commit. And each of the edges points to that commit's parent, the commit that happened before that commit. We're gonna talk about that all day because once you keep that graph in your head, then everything in Git makes sense and is easy. Git is, Git is an acquired taste. It's kind of like Vim. Once you know how it works, you're like, what the fuck is your problem? Obviously, this is the best way to do it. <laughs> but until you get over that hump of understanding how and why it's doing things, you know, it, it's just a bunch of magic. Next concept, working directory. Go away, team. So the working directory is, is a really easy concept in a lot of senses because you have this in subversion. It's just whatever directory you decide to store your project in. It typically has a .git subdirectory where all of the git stuff is stored, all of the repository history forever and ever, which is typically smaller than your actual source code. And then it has a bunch of other directories, whatever, source, resources, this is your choice, this is your repository. The difference between the working directory and Git and Subversion is like in Subversion, if you want a branch, you create a whole other copy somewhere else, and then you do a bunch of CD to go back and forth. You don't do that in Git. If you want to go back and forth between a branch, you do a checkout, and Git completely rejiggers your file in the working directory. <laughs> so that can scare you sometimes, and that can startle you. But once you make friends with Git, then you, you can trust it to save the code that you had in there before, and you don't have to worry so much. It has all the branches in here, but the branch you're currently working on, it just completely rewrites your working directory all the time uh, whenever you switch branches. So that's a little different. The working directory is the first place where you make changes, of course. Save a change. Oops. <coughs> 
maybe we change app.properties in here. And then we add another file, test.java in here. And then you do a get status. Git knows that you changed these and will initially be angry. My get status shows, shows it in red, but these changes are untracked, it says. And now we get to the staging area, place number two where your changes go. And this is completely an extra step from subversion. The staging area is some secret file in here. This is also called the index in a lot of Git documentation and man pages. That's a really confusing name for it. Just think of it as the staging area. And it's the first place your changes go. So if you want to save your changes in app.properties, you say git add, and that puts them in the staging area. And teaches git about them, and git starts constructing its magic. And then when you commit, you commit only what's in the staging area. So if you want to change the, save these changes separately from these, great. You stage this, you commit that. Um, and then you stage this, and you commit that. And that's one way you can tell your story because you don't have to commit everything at once. In Subversion, some of the IDEs try to make up for the lack of staging areas with things like commit lists, where you can group your files and commit chunks of them at once. But Git has this staging area where not only can you put the files, but you can do a Git status, you can see what you're about to commit. And if you want, if you've got three changes in app.properties, and two of them are related to your test changes, and one of them is not, you can put just a portion of those changes into the staging area and keep the rest of your changes in the working directory. That lets you tell a story. So if you're following your brother around with your digital camera, this staging area is a little preview screen on the back that shows you what you're filming, shows you what you're about to take a picture of. Place number three where your commits go is, or I'm sorry, where your changes go, is an actual commit. A commit is one of these nodes on the graph. Let's start this one over. So you start from nothing, and your first commit is the first node, and your second commit is another node, and its parent is the first one, and so on. Now, this commit is identified by its hash, this 40 character hex string. And the pieces of information in that hash are um, the, the tree, and this is a term you'll find in the man pages, but the tree represents the image of your working directory as it is after this commit. So that's like your picture of your source code. It also has your commit message, your author, your timestamp, blah, blah, blah. And it has this parent relationship. So the hash for this commit is based in part on the hash for this commit. And what that means is this commit, and all these objects are immutable, um, is tied to this parent. And this one is tied to this one. And that means that the name, the identifier for this commit, identifies not only the source code as it is at this commit, but the entire history of your code as it ever was. When Git is repairing, or comparing two repositories and it sees one commit with the same identifier, it doesn't have to go any farther. It knows that everything underneath those is the same. Kind of weird, but that's what it does. Commit. Those are about as poor as it gets. Now we get to the cool stuff. Because these commits, they never change. Once that identifier is set, that identifier is set. But what does change is, I mean, we, we create new ones all day, but these particular ones don't change. But what you can change is where you are in the tree. Because a branch, including the master branch, is one file in the .get directory with 40 characters in it that references a commit. So this is a pointer. Who's done pointers in C? And pointer arithmetic? Good, 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 good. 
you can do point of arithmetic and get. It's kind of weird when you talk about um, relative commits. But that's outside scope, sorry. Anyway, the branch is a pointer to the commit, and that's key. And then there's another guy here, he's a little weird, head, who's actually a pointer to the pointer to the commit. So head is pointing to your current branch, and your current branch is pointing to a commit. What head means is this is where you're currently working. And when it does a diff against the files in the repository and the files in your working directory, it's using head to know what the repository's picture, what gets picture the repository is. And the cool thing about these being pointers is you can move them around, and you can move them around for free. Because it doesn't have to write anything new to the repository, it's a 40 character file. So when we want a branch, we say get checkout dash b feature. Feature is an arbitrary name that I've given this branch. Bam, we just branched. That's it, no copying files anywhere, one 40 character file in the .get directory. And then head has altered because we checked it out. We're now current branches feature. When we do a commit, the current branch moves to the new commit. Other branches stay where they are because they're just pointers. These two. Now, it gets cool when you've got your feature commits, you've done work on a branch, and you want to merge that back into master. So, what you do is you say, check out master, moves your head to point to the master branch, and it rejiggers your directory to look like this. And then you say, merge feature, get merge feature. And it's going to merge in these changes, but all it really does whoop, is change that one file. That's called a fast forward merge. You'll see that word pop up all the time. And that's exactly what it means, is it moves the pointer up the commit graph. If you have a Mac, please, please download Git X. If you don't have a Mac, you can use Get GUI or Get K, one of the built-in ones. But GitX just shows you a picture of this commit graph, and uh, it actually makes it look like you're using a Mac. It makes it pretty. <laughs> Much better. Um, and then what you can do is, whenever you want to do something in Git, especially if you're nervous, um, open GitX, look at the picture of the commit graph, think about what you want it to do, try typing something, Command R will tell it to refresh, and then you can see if what changed is what you wanted. Highly recommend that tool. So now you know how to get how to do a fast forward merge. That's the trivial kind where only one of the branches that you're merging changed. What if while we're on master, we go make some more commits? So now master is up here and we say get merge feature. Well, what happens is, since get knows about changes, it takes these changes and applies them to this, and these changes and applies them to this, and puts those into a new commit, and this is a merge commit, which just shows up in the commit message typically. And there. Now, the weird thing about that commit, as you can see, is it has two parents. There's not really a limit to how many parents a commit has, but if it has more than one, then it was a merge. If there are conflicts, and I tell you this because this has seriously confused me in the past, it doesn't make this commit yet. What it does is it puts all the happy files that didn't have conflicts in staging, and it puts everything with conflicts in your working directory, you, you edit the working directory, and this is your standard diff, your head, which is your current stuff, and it'll have your text, and then the equal signs, and the other stuff, and then where it's merging from, the feature. Your merge conflicts will look like that, which is very standard to diff. That's no different from subversion. Once you resolve those, 
then you add those files to the staging area, you commit, and there's your merge commit, and master goes forward, and it's the same thing. Git is a lot better at merging than Subversion for several reasons. It's just merges are more smooth in Git. For one thing, you make branches all day and you pull them in all day because it's a lot easier. For another thing, Git in Subversion, it's comparing picture before, first after, <coughs> second after. In Git, it's saying, okay, okay, there was this change and this change and this change and this change. And that's more information. So Git has more information to do the merge than just before and after. So it's generally better at merging. You'll have fewer conflicts than you do with subversion. And you should not be afraid of it. But if we, if we forget about these conflicts, let's get rid of these darn conflicts. There's another way to tell the story <coughs> of the merge. If you have conflicts, you have to have a merge commit. You're making changes actively to resolve those conflicts. But if you don't, oops, I erased too much of that. If you're starting from here with the master, and you made some changes, and you made some changes in the feature, and now you're ready to merge your feature in. <coughs> and these are totally unrelated to this bug fix over here. And you don't really want this merge commit talking about how you did the merge. Um, you have another option, and that option is rebase. And rebase, okay, okay, rebase is really scary. <laughs> because rebase can do so much strange stuff that has nothing to do with rebase. It can rewrite your history all day long. And that's cool, but that's out of scope. Um, rebase interactive, you can find all kinds of recipe books on Google about what you can do with that. But at its core, to understand the concept of rebase, rebase moves the base of this branch. Your arrows are probably oh, dang it. Thank you, Karen. I made my, oh, touching my board. Don't touch the whiteboard. Parent relationship goes that way. Um, all right. So when we want to rebase this branch, what we're doing is moving the base of this branch. We're saying, let's pretend I did that feature off of this commit. Now what it does, you say you're on master. You say get. No, no, actually, usually want to get a feature, but it doesn't really matter. Get rebase master. Rebase my current branch as if it was taken <coughs> off of the commit that's pointed to by master. These commits are immutable. Git can't move them. It can't change these arrows, because that would change their identifiers. But it creates new ones by take these changes, apply it to that. Take these changes, apply it to that. Move the pointer. And that's rebase. And now you have this little string of pearls configuration in your commit graph it makes it look like a single line instead of that diamond. So that's totally your option for how you want your project to tell the story. You can edit history. Now, there's one time when you should never do that. Editing your history is like taking your video that you took of your little brother with your digital camera and loading it up in Camtasia and editing it, picking out the parts that you want to tell the world and eliminating the parts you don't. You can change commit messages, like you're adjusting the volume, all kinds of stuff. But, there's one time when you never want to do that. Incidentally, um, these commits that no longer have a, a branch pointing to them will be garbage collected when you do get GC. They stay around, though, until you say get GC. So they're still there. You've never lost anything. You can find them with get lost and found. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to pretend that they're done. Now, remote. We talked a lot about your repository, but there's all these other repositories in the world, and how do you work with them? Let's say we have a remote repository over here, and it looks a lot like ours, 
except it doesn't have our new feature stuff. It has its own master branch. And if we've established this as a remote called origin, then we have an origin master branch, which is just a pointer to a commit in our repository. And these commits are all identical. So if we decide, well, first of all, we need to get someone else's changes in here. Got a remote. Now somebody else on your team makes a change. And this one's master pulls up. How do we get those changes? Come on, you guys use get. How do we get those changes over here? <coughs> Wrong. Fetch. Thank you. <laughs> okay, get pull is what you do when you're trying to pretend you work in subversion. It's just an alias for fetch and merge. But if you're thinking about what you're doing, it's much better to do those in two steps. So when we do a fetch, we get all the new data from origin, everything that's new over here that we don't have, this commit comes over here, and we say, oh, look, here's origin master. <coughs> so now that we have that, we can choose when we want to pull these into our master branch. Do we want to pull these changes in first? Because this feature branch is still off of our master. Do we want to pull this into master? And that would be a fast forward merge. We would move our guy up here, and then merge these in, or not. It's up to us. So typically, after you do a fetch, you do a get merge origin master. Well, let's, okay, check out master. Merge origin master. And now our master's up here. So now say we want to merge in our feature branch. Maybe there's conflicts, or maybe we don't feel like rebasing today. So we do a get merge feature. And now we have something that origin does not. So how do we get our changes over there? Which is not a good question. Push. Yes, we actually push. That's just one step. So when we push, Git says, okay, what do we know that this one doesn't? Now if somebody else had introduced changes over here, it would complain and make you get those and do any merging that's necessary before <coughs> it takes yours. But assuming no one else has added changes, it's going to create this commit over here and advance this. And it's also going to need these orange ones, which came off of this commit. Now origin master is up with our master. And you'll notice that it copied all the commits that were in the history of our master branch. So everybody gets that. Talked about get, talked about push. Push is another one of those things that lets us tell our story. Because frankly, having our remote, our own local repository and deciding when we want to tell the world about it is what gives us the privacy to edit our story, to decide what we want to be in it, to look at it in GitX, look at our commit messages and decide whether, yes, we're ready to share this with the world. And then push is like uploading it to YouTube. I think that's really cool. I love having my own place to mess around. And I can save my work all day long. And nobody has to be the wiser if I broke the belt. Finally, I'm going to get to where I wanted to go a couple months ago. And this is just another tool, another technology, that once you know the commit branch, this is really easy. I'm not tall enough, so I'm going to have to move these down. Say we're here. We don't have a feature branch, but we wish we did. And we do some work, and I do some work, and now I'm like, damn it, I wish I had branched. I do. Get branch feature. And this is one of the ways to tell your story because that branch that creates that tag is like saving your game.
get branch name totally saves your game. Ooh. Wait, 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 I forgot. Master was up there because we did this work on master. And get branch feature in this case, whatever you name your branch, saves your game at the current place where head is. So if you're working and you need to save your changes on a branch, commit them, never hurts to commit. You can go back and change the commit later, which is awesome. Um, so feature is totally saving our game. I didn't check out the branch, so feature stayed on, or I'm sorry, head stayed on master. But now I want to go fix a bug, and I want to fix the bug from down here, not from up there. So step two is get reset dash dash hard origin master. And bam, master's back down here at the commit pointed to by origin master. I could also give it the full identifier of this commit. What reset does is move a pointer. That's all reset does. It says, I want this branch pointer to be on this commit. Just really cool. You can move pointers around in this graph all day. Then when you go fix your bugs, that was there. All is well and good. You can get back to this safe game whenever you want by that branch name. Um, and now I, I did mention that this was get reset dash dash hard. Dash dash hard says, one of many command line options, that says rewrite the files in my working directory to be what the new commit is. That'll confuse you. If you just do reset, it'll leave your files up here and then you'll your git status will show a bunch of changes that you didn't want. Um, you could also do git reset and then say check out what did you do dash f for create for rejigger all my files. Okay, just check out the Yeah, you can say git check out master again. And that would um, fix your files to match the commit you're currently on. That's it. That's reset. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Amend is like, is really fun because it just lets you change your current commit. It's like a super easy way to rewrite your most recent history. If you put some new files into staging and then say git commit dash dash amend, it'll add those to your current commit. Not literally, it'll actually create a new commit with all those changes in it and move your branch pointer over there. <laughs> well, no one will know you screwed up because you'll never push this. The key to all of this changing history, commit amend, rebase. Uh, I think amend only allows you to work on the last commit. Yes. But if you do an interactive rebase, you can actually do as many commits as you want. Yes. The, the other thing, the thing that you can do in rebase that's really awesome is squash, and that just lets you put two commits together. So if you did this commit, and then you're like, crap, I broke some tests, and you do some stuff and you do this commit, you can squash those together into one so that nobody knows you ever did that. Also a way that you can edit your videotape to tell your story differently. Um, and and this, this stray commit out there, no one will ever know about that either, because it will never get pushed to origin because it doesn't have that branch tag. Any other questions? I hope that this has given you the foundation. If you can hold this commit graph in your head, then you can really understand what you need to do in Git. And you can consciously tell your project story instead of following your little brother around the video camera. And so there's, Git has a lot of features, like advanced features, that uh, you can do a lot of crazy things. So imagine if you started working on a project and you have two different like, parts and you're actually like, well, these are actually two different projects. I need to separate these out. You can actually take them and split off the history of certain directories or certain files and just pull out the history of all the things you changed later on. Yeah, yeah, I've done that too. <clears throat> yeah, we did not scratch the surface of the power of Git. We more like glistened off of the surface. <laughs> but this is, this is basically what Subversion can do only in get terms. And once you start thinking about it like this, then you can add a zillion other um, things. Uh, references. Um, 
I did a lot of this talk based on think like a git. Think woo, like a git. Dot net. Um, another great reference. I'm not going to give the URL because it's long, but if you just Google git magic, you'll find a spell book of a million zillion fancy things you can do with git. And this will give you some hope of maybe understanding it, but that will totally tell you what to type. Have you read the Pro Get book? The nope. Pro Get web website? Nope. Anyway, it's just another so helpful not resource. An expert. I just said, man, I need to learn this stuff, so I better do a talk on it. There's a couple of um, Get videos on uh, heap code that are really good. Yeah. Well, Pro Get is a free. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, pay for them, but they're still pretty cool. Pro Get is a free ebook. And it's full of all sorts of diagrams and all sorts of things like that. So I mean, it gives you the, the computer science behind it, but it also gives you a lot of things you can copy and paste, you know, and techniques for getting things done. So good resource in addition to the thing I could get, which really benefited me. So yeah, this is the background, and then there's a ton of stuff online that will tell you what to type. The hard part is to get it to tell you what's really going on. Thanks, guys.